came to order at 6.07 p.m. And welcome everyone. And let's start us off with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everyone could please stand. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and I would like to start the meeting with introducing our newest commissioner, Dominic Veretti, if you would like to introduce yourself. Yes, uh, hi everybody. My name is Dominic Veretti. Uh, I've been in Corona about 25 years. Um, I'm excited to get started. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. Great, thank you, and we look forward to getting to know you, and thanks for joining us. Um, we are going to skip over approving the minutes because we do not have a quorum. Um, and I understand that there is no communication from the public, um, but I will go ahead and read that in case anyone present. Persons wishing to address the Parks and Recreation Commission on items listed on the agenda are requested to identify themselves and state the matter on which they wish to comment. No action will be taken on matters not listed on the agenda. The Commission will appreciate your cooperation in keeping your comments brief. Um, Christy, do we have any written communication from the public? No, we do not. All right. Well, with that, we will start with um, Jason Lass and the 4th of July celebration recognition. All right. And we have a presentation here for you. So uh, good evening, commissioners. Last time I was before you, I had to share the uh, sad and unfortunate news that our traditional activities would need to be canceled uh, for this year as a result of the COVID-19 impact. Um, not one to give up hope, um, our team quickly regrouped uh, to work toward finding unique ways uh, we could celebrate the community. Uh, based on survey data and input from the Public Services Committee, as well as uh, this commission, we were uh, able to quickly work to ensure our nation and this community were, of course, celebrated. So our red, white, and you digital 4th of July celebration occurred online July 1st through the 4th uh, with different content being posted each day. Our initial uh, analytics find that we had a total reach of about 53,000 individuals. Uh, per post, this was between 8,000 and 18,500. Um, again, this depended on what the item was. Um, our video streaming minutes were 68,875 minutes. So this is time people spent watching the content we posted, uh, which represents a little over uh, 1,150 hours, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so with that, we did have a, seven original videos, um, which I'll kind of talk about a little bit more as we get going. And the content was really warmly received with plenty of likes, uh, shares, um, which is really fun to see for us. So the primary components of the Red, White, and You Digital 4th of July celebration uh, included a share your message where residents submitted entries uh, to be compiled into a video. Um, thank you, Commissioner McCreary uh, and former Commissioner Woods uh, for uh, starring in our call for submissions video. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we had a home and business decorating contest. The Yankee Doodle Dog or Pet contest. Uh, again, that exclusive video content, and then links to other programs to help provide that true Independence Day experience. Uh, this included a Capital Fourth, which is a national program featuring celebrity performances, military tributes, and the fireworks we all love so much. Uh, today, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge our partners, winning entries, and everyone who gave into this uh, little wild idea we had and showed their support. So first up is our Yankee Doodle Dog or Pet Competition. We had 18 entries, including two lovely felines who shared one of those entries. Voting was done uh, by the community via our Facebook in the form of likes or reactions. This is going to be a fun presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so in third place, uh, late entry Bailey Ray quickly rose the ranks with a reminder to families to keep their pets safe this holiday. In second place, Ivy was a strong contender right out the gate, holding the number two position throughout the competition. And finally, Charlie snagged first place with an undeniably adorable display of patriotism. <laughs> a little bit about Charlie, he loves cuddles, car rides, walks, toys, uh, his mom wins from the claw machine, and all sorts of adventures, as long as they're with his family. He also indulges his humans uh, 
and when they make him dress up uh, for the occasional photo op. So uh, congratulations to our winners. Uh, each uh, earned bragging rights and then received a donated gift card to PetSmart. Uh, the home and decorating contest was a feature we were all really excited about. Uh, while we only received 11 official entries, there was no denying the number of uh, patriotic displays throughout our community. Uh, this was really comforting to see, especially during these times. Um, I thank our commissioners for being a part of the process by voting for their favorites and each of the categories as follows. Uh, so do note uh, that some of the entries, uh, we did not include full names or uh, if they did not want their full address displayed, we have admitted those. So first up is best nighttime display uh, to Miss Judy H with her warmly lit porch. Best business or nonprofit went to our friends at the American Legion Post 216 with their proud patriotic display. Land of the free, dazzled in abundance, snagging best porch. Like a vision from an HGTV show, the Cali Corona Cottage won for best home. Abby's giggling over here. <laughs> Sorry. I love your descriptions. <laughs> and finally, uh, with a display made with love, Girl Scout Troop 142 earned a prestigious Commissioner's Choice. Our winning entries also received bragging rights, as well as cool winner yard signs that they can put out uh, for all to see. So uh, with the Digital Fourth, um, I was personally challenged uh, doing more work with video. Um, Commissioner McCreary uh, certainly witnessed that as we uh, took her out uh, and did our own little photo shoot there. Uh, fortunately, our residents and partners came through with some amazing content uh, that really made our community shine. Uh, we, of course, had a number of groups vying for the Star Spangled Banner, and uh, we had to include the Christian Arts Theater, CAT, uh, as they dazzled us in years past with their live uh, event performances. And um, <clears throat> they were actually selected to perform at our 2020 event uh, this year. Uh, so, you know, things happen, but uh, we, of course, wanted to carry on that tradition and allow them that opportunity. So Miss Maya uh, Ramirez uh, hit nothing but beautiful notes, launching our digital event on the 1st. Never Underachievers, Off-Broadway, Corona Theater, not only submitted a short-form military tribute video, which we featured, uh, they put together a full 30-minute program showcasing talent from within the community with patriotic song selections and stage performances from 1776, a musical based on the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So all you Hamilton fans, take note. That is definitely one you will not want to miss. Our next performance of the Star Spangled Banner was an impressive feat under the direction of Marco uh, Mejia, the Corona Symphony Orchestra, featuring members of our community, uh, performed an impressive rendition of our national anthem using a state-of-the-art uh, socially distanced uh, recording technology. Uh, so basically, all these pictures kind of assembled uh, according to the instruments uh, that were being played. And this was just absolutely so impressive um, to the point that it was actually picked up by NBC and CBS affiliates who uh, featured it as part of the evening news. Um, last, I want to recognize our talented team members at the City of Corona uh, who worked tirelessly behind the scenes. While Library and Recreation Services certainly carry the torch, I must thank uh, Cindy Solis and Management Services uh, for assembling our Share Your Message video, um, which was an absolute joy to wake up to uh, there on the 4th. And then in broadcast, Mr. Alexander Abbey. Alex, you there? <laughs> uh, whose military tribute served as the finale to our program, featuring over 200 brave men and women from uh, the Corona area uh, who served uh, our country. Uh, this was really intended to be a surprise for our residents uh, who take part as in the military banner program, and the emotional response it rendered was undeniable. So given the circumstances, I think the festivities came off as fun. Um, they encourage community involvement and we're celebratory without losing what makes our community unique. Uh, this being our first time uh, offering anything like this, I think we're all pleasantly uh, pleased with the level of engagement. Uh, next year, I assume we'll be back to normal, but it might be fun to repeat a couple of these digital events uh, to lead up to our day of festivities. Again, I congratulate our winners and thank our partners who exceeded expectations uh, with amazing uh, service to our community. Happy Independence Day. Thank you.
thank you so much for your report. Um, I definitely enjoyed um, looking at all the posts on um, Facebook and seeing everyone's um, clips and pictures. Um, congratulations to our winners and thank you to all of the participants. Um, I would love to see um, some of those house decorating, business decorating, pet contest carryover. Um, I think that would be a great idea. So I will see if my other commissioners have any comments or questions. Um, Mr. Veretti, do you have anything to add? Mr. Omasi? Yeah, Jason, I'd, I'd just like to say that, you know, you did such a fine job under very, very trying conditions. And uh, the innovation that, that you got your department has showed and you showed during this, uh, it could, could be carried forward. I'd, I would like to see you present this at a school board meeting. And they make a really, really big deal about 9-11. And I think that we're going to be needing some patriotism and togetherness in the schools when the kids come back. So I think that what we need to do is possibly getting you on the agenda at a school board meeting if they ever meet in the real form and uh, letting you let them see what we had done or what, what we had done when I say as a, as a city, but what you had done and hopefully get that as a, as a movement that can move forward at the schools. I think this would be a really cool thing. Very simple, but very direct and to the point. I, I applaud what you guys did. It was really good. And then I did have a question about the 4th of July. Um, some of the money that we didn't spend not having the different events, is any of that able to carry over to next year to make next year's just a little bit extra special? Is that... Well, uh, at this time, with uh, the current budget, we are uh, assuming that we would be doing a, a full steam ahead uh, patriotic uh, display um, as we have in years past. Um, the budget level is exactly the same as what it would have been this year. Um, but I think renewed community spirits going to bring a lot of attention to that event. A lot of people really felt a loss. Um, I myself, you know, I've been doing Fourth of July for 16 years. I woke up on the morning and I was sad. Like this is what I do. I this felt completely out of place. So I think we're all going to come back with new vigor. Um, and as a partnership-based uh, approach, I think we're willing to work with those community organizations to always do things bigger and better. Um, you know, if we have grand ideas, um, let's take those to uh, public services and explore them. All right, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I want to clarify. I think what, what Elizabeth was asking is the money that we saved for this for from not having it this year is that going to roll into general fund or is that going to be allocated and bankrolled for next year? Yeah, I'll be happy to answer that uh, question, uh, commissioners. The um, as you probably know, as a result of COVID nineteen, um, there were a number of financial impacts to the city in general. Uh, departmentally, uh, we refunded six hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars to folks for programs that were not run. Um, the city saw a significant decrease in sales tax, et cetera. So essentially, a couple of months uh, into the process, each department went back uh, to indicate what savings were going to be so that we could do all that we could to um, balance the general fund budget. And so those funds were part of that savings. I, think, I just think it's, 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 it's something that needs to be transparent. I think we needed to, to let you know, let people know that on, for the record that I don't want people coming back next year saying, well, you didn't do it last year. Where well, was that money that we didn't spend last year? So now seeing that it's gone back to the general fund, I think that's, that's a transparent thing that you, you've done well. So I think that needs to be addressed. Thank you. All right, um, I see that we don't have any youth here for the youth updates, understandably. Um, do we have any administrative reports? Yes, we do. We have a, a PowerPoint that Jason and I put together with library and recreation service updates. So we just need that. Oh, I'm sorry, I stepped on you, Tom. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tom. 
Okay, now, you know, we get a lot of questions about how things are going moving forward. So Jason and I are going to provide an overview of our programs, services, and planned safety precautions as they pertain to our modified operations as we reopen. Do you want to click me, Jason? Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. So with the stay-at-home orders eased in May, City Hall reopened to the community on June 1st. The stages displayed here are a bit deceiving. While originally we thought these would be black and white, as can be seen, it really is a spectrum experience. Um, stage two has been drawn out into multiple accelerated iterations, for example. Some items like park use were bounced back and forth or even segmented into types of use. And similar to our last presentation, we're really at the mercy of the county and state and have been in constant contact with them to ensure we are following safety reentry procedures. And for our purposes today, we just want to review what we have been able to do within the guidelines of these stages. So first, I will give you an overview of what Corona Public Library has been doing. We did start a click, park, and pick up service. This is our walk-up service. We don't really call it a curbside service because we can't have people driving right up to the curb for it. They park and walk. So this has been in place since the last week of May, operating Tuesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Patrons are able to put a hold on items. We check them out and then contact them and schedule time when they can pick that item up. That has been really successful and especially busy over the weekend. We have a lot of holds to place and check out to people on Monday. Summer at your library is still happening. Dig deeper. So the Summer Reading Challenge continues even in the midst of the pandemic. Registration is available online, and staff are operating in front of the library during the click, park, and pick up time. While participation is lower than our usual summer, we have had about 600 participants. And just as a reminder, Summer Reading Challenge is available to all ages and abilities. If people do not have access to online, then they are welcome to call. We have staff from 8 to 5 at the phones, and they'll help people register or direct them to visit during Click, Park, and Pick Up to register if they're interested. We also have Zoom book groups. We have determined to utilize some grant funding to support a Zoom subscription. We have utilized this for our adult book club, 10, 11 people participating every month, which is what we were getting in person. Our TAC has been meeting virtually this way. Volunteer orientation has happened. I mentioned I was talking with Mr. Almsay about our the wall that heals that's coming up in October, and we've had some volunteer orientations for that. So we are using Zoom to accomplish that. And there's some other programming opportunities that are planned in the coming months to be able to live, to interact live with our community, even if they can't come into the facility yet. Lars, where you are, we've talked about in prior months. This is expanded to a space on our website that we've named Virtual Lars. This space includes story times, our contract instructors, maker exchange activities, adaptive offerings, and links to our department's YouTube channel. And this will be continued, uh, this will continue to be integrated into parts of our service even as we reopen. It's another way to connect with people. It'll just be the percentage of programs that are on there versus what's in person. And library reopening has been a big question. And we are always talking with our other groups, our other jurisdictions, um, to see what are they doing and what, are, what best practices should we be implementing. We are tentatively planning a reopening of service on site beginning on Monday, July 13th. On site services will be available with an appointment on Mondays and Saturdays. Click, park, and pick up will move to Tuesday through Friday and our civic rec software will be used for reservations. And these may be made online or via a phone call. We have also created a COVID code of conduct, which users must agree to to register for on-site services. This includes wearing a face covering and practicing social distancing. The initial service we'll offer will be book browsing. Then the next week, we'll add study room usage. And then the next week, access to the workstations. We want to make sure everything's working smoothly and we're able to uh, control the numbers that are coming in effectively. To also encourage social distancing and ease of sanitation, most of the chairs and furniture have been relocated or removed in the main parts of the library. 
We are also awaiting the arrival and installation of sneeze guards for our public desks before finalizing the date of opening. We have a press release ready to go. Hopefully we can put Monday, July 13th on there, but if we don't have all the safety precautions in, we do want to exercise caution and delay that date if we do need to. All right, on the, the recreation side, um, I just have to say as a recreation professional, it's really exciting for me to see some of our programs starting to reopen. Um, we're a community-oriented group, and it's hard to have community without directly working with our clients. Um, our first big uh, return item was the reopening of our splash pads at Citrus and Ridgeline with modified use instructions. Thank you, Tom and team. Uh, since they reopened on June uh, 16th, uh, we have been out to the site several times now, and it's a joy to see the families enjoying these spaces again. Um, our team has have been helping uh, support with daily sanitizing and ensuring equipment is functioning uh, correctly there. Uh, Venture Camp uh, got a late start uh, for the season on June 22nd. Uh, we modified programs per state guidelines. This include uh, reducing our capacity by half and doubling our usable space. Um, our initial response is only a quarter of what we would normally serve with about 36 participants each week, uh, but the families who are ready for these services have been very uh, appreciative. Um, with this, uh, we have been able to expand with some uh, partial day seats, um, which has been helpful for parents who might not need that full uh, day program. Uh, the program will run through August 7th, and then we will revert back to our Kids Club afternoon uh, school program uh, at our 10 sites there. Uh, Summer Aquatics returned on June 29th with a greatly modified program. Uh, again, we followed state guidelines. We scaled back our operations to the city park pool, lowered class size to semi-private with a 1 to 3, um, or some cases 1 to 4 ratio, and limited the number of offerings uh, to allow sanitizing breaks uh, between each of our classes. Um, Based on uh, past knowledge, you know, we of course anticipated a, a sellout, but um, you know, enrollments coming in at a steady basis, we have sold out the season, and I think the parents are very um, understanding of our modified practices as it pertains to this program. Swim skills are absolutely essential for our community, and we are glad that um, we can teach this um, to our, our youngest residents who really need it. Uh, <clears throat> Next week, uh, we are going to be kicking off a new Circle City uh, Youth Sports Camp, which is a scaled back partial day program at two hours, four days a week. Uh, each week will have a different sport as its focus with week one, basketball, week two, indoor soccer, week three, volleyball, and week four, flag football. So in lieu of the traditional team play uh, aspect, we are, of course, making uh, the day camp operations uh, our central uh, target there. And then it's more of a skills and drills um, activity, and this is a of course, in compliance with local guidelines. So we might not have, you know, as much physical exchange or um, shared equipment there, but um, it'll be a lot of fun. I can guarantee you that. And then uh, last up, we have uh, upped our uh, online learning options. We have a half dozen uh, traditional uh, in-person classes that have been flipped into online models. Uh, we're also working with an online education center to expand our offerings with uh, hundreds of uh, potential classes that we can curate uh, specifically for the corona community. Um, we're also exploring ways we can increase outdoor options by modifying our existing programs. And then um, the, the current situation has also led us to rethink some of our events and uh, future activities. While as devastating as it was for many of us to cancel the fourth, as I previously observed, um, our Red, White, and You digital fourth celebration did make a very solid impression on the community. Uh, this month, we were fortunate enough to receive a grant through the California Park and Recreation Society, CPRS, uh, to bring Agents of Discovery to the city of Corona as part of uh, Parks Make Life Better Month. Uh, Agents of Discovery is an educational tech platform and app that uses the latest augmented reality, AR, uh, to get youth and families active and engaged with the world around them. Uh, players assume the role of a secret agent on a mission, and they compete, uh, sorry, they complete site-specific geo-trigger challenges um, that are created by um, the library and recreation services staff. So we've been very fortunate to work with uh, our, our counterparts at the library and include this as part of uh, the summer at your library. So think of this as kind of like a Pokemon Go, uh, but much safer and more educational. So we actually kicked off uh, this week at the Historic Civic Center and then Santana Regional Park. And then each week we're going to be adding um, to our missions and different sites. So the idea is we get people moving around, getting different neighborhoods, um, and getting them to interact and have you know a fun, positive uh, experience out there while still being appropriately social distanced. So uh, next week we'll be kicking off at Ridgeline, uh, the 
week of the July 20th, we'll be at Eagle Glen. And then uh, Village Walk Park will be our concluding week. And we actually have Lars on the go, uh, reactivated, uh, to help get people in the game. So the Mondays of those first weeks, our friendly staff will be on site to talk about the game, walk you through missions, and provide some air high fives. Uh, the team will be making, um, of course, those weekly stops, you know, a lot of fun just to kind of get out there, show some presence. You know, we, we miss our community and we want to uh, be out there having fun too, of course. So it's not quite the e-gaming you guys were talking about last time, but um, it's definitely an interesting step toward uh, using technology and play while still uh, getting exercise and some good sunshine on your face there. Uh, for the month of September, we have another fun uh, digital activity uh, the whole community can get involved in, and this is called BioBlitz, uh, Parks for Pollinators. So in partnership with the National uh, Recreation and Parks Association, NRPA, uh, California Academy of Science, and National Geographic, uh, residents can use the iNaturalist app uh, to explore local parks and learn about the, the world around them. So information collected by residents not only educates them about what they can find living in their neighborhoods, but also helps uh, the city uh, identify local species and understand uh, how to best manage our natural areas. Uh, the data that is collected has a further uh, real-life application as it contributes to a national collection of information uh, that can help uh, further pollinator research. So this is actually being turned into real scientific data, and it's really fun. Um, I've been testing this with my kiddo. Um, we just go out, we take pictures of bugs and little animals and we identify them and other people comment on them. Really cool. So we're still kind of fielding how we're going to introduce this community, but I think people are going to get a kick out of it. And then, of course, uh, permitted things get better. Uh, we are working toward our uh, classic events, including, as uh, Abby mentioned, the Wall That Heals in October. So this could be a special one-time offering uh, with a scale replica of the Vietnam uh, Memorial. Uh, we are looking at bringing back Hollow Weekend and, of course, uh, concluding the year with our annual holiday lighting celebration. So as citywide response continues, the COVID Information Call Center has morphed a little bit in terms of staffing. It is still available with calls going to our library administration staff to field or forward as needed. In addition, the info, li info line staff have been assigned to respond to the emails and SMS sent each day with the exception of Sundays. So there's still a nice response team there giving timely information to our community. And in our continuing role of care and shelter, we continue to assist groups who wish to coordinate food distribution and, of course, support our seniors in some ways that Jason <clears throat> will outline now. Uh, so, of course, you know, recreation is known for our army of part-time staff, and we have been able to assign our team members in new and interesting ways. Uh, we have continued to operate the phone assurance line for our senior center participants, uh, so we can check in on them, provide a friendly social outlet, and, uh, of course, resource and referral as needed. Um, in lieu of the city expanding our janitorial contract, uh, we've actually been able to help out the maintenance services team um, by allowing some of our, our staff to go out into the city facilities where they function as a day porter, and they help us sanitize uh, facilities for um, our, our um, city hall, police, and fire um, in lieu of a more uh, expensive outside contract. Uh, we have had uh, other odd jobs, uh, too, uh, including helping other departments catch up on remote office work, um, doing twice weekly park monitoring, and even alley cleanup. Uh, we have continued to help with food resources um, with Feeding America, the Brown Bag Program. Uh, we have moved to Santana Park, and um, we are also helping um, community, organiza <laughs> sorry, community organizers uh, with food distribution um, that they've been hosting here on Sundays uh, in the City Hall uh, parking lot. Well, you know, of course, this might not be as much fun as our normal work. Um, it certainly helps those uh, who need these hours, and I think it, you know, just kind of reflects um, our adaptability um, given the current circumstances. So I believe everyone is very well versed in phases and their unpredictable nature. Staff do continue to prepare for future phases of opening, to network with other agencies, to develop best practices, and to safely return to something like normal whatever that may look like as we move forward. As we do offer more services, it has been really rewarding to engage with our community again, even if it's from six feet and behind a mask. It's nice to see everybody, and they're happy to see us too. So that's been, that's been good as we, as we work this direction.
Yeah, and I, I would just add that we're diligently working toward reopening. Um, we understand the stages can be confusing, and there's plenty of mixed messages out there. You know, while camps may uh, proceed, uh, the county turned around again with strict reminder that youth sports practices are not yet permitted. Um, for our team, uh, we're really trying to maintain um, flexibility and, um, you know, being responsive um, to, you know, those green lights as they come, um, you know, us getting camp running or, you know, any other program, we did this in record time. You know, we usually have months to prepare for these kind of things, but we had, you know, multiple kind of variants staged in our minds of what this might look like. And as soon as we got that green light, we were able to turn on a dime and make sure that happened for our community here. Um, so again, you know, we're just really looking forward to, you know, getting back to normal, um, as soon as it's safe to do so and you know we miss you and we look forward to serving you and we're going to get there and that wraps it up <laughs> <laughs> thank you um i will start with commissioner veretti do you have any comments or questions um i know how hard it's been for both of you guys with everything going on and i just uh applaud you guys for being proactive and so aggressive and doing your guys's part thank you Uh, Jason, the, that, that 500, go back to the, the slide where you uh, talked about the resource, that, that, that one there. Do go back there. The brown bag food distribution, 200 families. Where are you drawing the resources on that? Uh, so we actually partner with Feeding America on that. Um, so that's a program we've actually opted into before this all even happened, um, where we would provide uh, meals um, for our senior center. Um, with the, the impact of COVID-19, um, I think that put a spotlight on that event. And, you know, we were not able to go into the senior center, so we were doing a drive through over there. Um, and we quickly outgrew what we would normally do, where it was just wrapping around the whole block. Um, last month, we moved over to Santana again. In, you know, we thought we had all this awesome space we can do, you know, work with, and it just wrapped all the way up and around there. Uh, and then this morning, you know, back at it again, we changed some of the schematics, uh, pushed out further, um, and we even got extra help uh, from um, some of our volunteers um, from throughout the city, and we were able to get them uh, out there running um, smoothly as possible. Um, you know, the event starts at 10. People are there at 7 a.m. before we even get there, uh, lining up, and, you know, as soon as 10 came, we actually were able to break down all the pallets that were received, uh, get them loaded up in the vehicles, and have them on their way, which is just absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, today we served over um, 200 vehicles, but that represents nearly 600 individuals as part of families. And you do this, what's the what's the time frame on that? What do you do, two days a week, one day a week? So it's actually every uh, second Wednesday. Every second Wednesday. Yes, and this is part of uh, Through the Feeding America. So that's our, our most local destination. Uh, of course, there's many different food resources in our community. So right. as we're, our phone assurance line is reaching out to those seniors, um, we get the, the phone calls into our info line too. We can point people in the right direction for whatever resources we need. Uh, our staff at the Senior Center really care about their participants. Is that on our that website? Relationship. Is, that, is that on our website as well? Yeah, that's all on the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, section okay. there. Um, I echo um, Commissioner Veretti's that I applaud all of your efforts in trying to be creative programming in this um, this time. I do have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned expanded online courses. How are you advertising those? Are those things that have already been occurring or are you talking about upcoming? I haven't necessarily seen anything about that. We started the virtual LARS maybe a month ago in terms of including the contract classes on there. And I think part of what the hitch has been in getting that information out is coordinating that with the update in our Corona connection. So when that starts to go out for the fall, it'll be a little more normal way that we get that information out to people. So right now we're using our social media, mm -hmm. we're using press releases, we have our Lars Insider that we are, that was a monthly publication, but now we're pushing that out every two or three weeks, just when we have some updated information. And our Cindy Solis will include information also on the um, inner circle news. So we're, we're trying to get the word of mouth out there as much as we can. Yes, and I, I would just add for the, the contract classes program, I mean, that's kind of an ugly title, but um, that's essentially the content that you would see in our Corona Connection, all those classes there that you could sign up for. And that so, actually is my next question is what, 
what is it looking like as far as our contract class mm -hmm. offerings? Um, you know, I, I know a lot of them usually start in August. And are we having any contract teachers willing to come back with modifications? What kind of offerings, like what level of programming are we going to expect? Mm -hmm. Do we have any insight as to, like, have you been in contact with our contract, like our preschool teachers? Are we going to have any of that with modifications or any kind of update on any of that. Yes, and and that's a challenging program because we're again that's one of those ones we plan for months in advance, you know, we have work with, you know, 100 instructors and we send them, you know, information on how to make their proposal to the city. We have to go through them and choose, you know, what's the best fit. Um, and then, you know, how can we maintain normalcy? So our intent going into the fall winter season is that things would be getting normal. So we're putting all that forward and then from there we have to scale back as appropriate. Also, kind of following trends, we're trying to incorporate more of those online learning courses. So right now, there was only about a half dozen that are appearing um, on our Civic Rec uh, platform for registration, and then we did advertise those through social media. But we're looking at getting lots more online as that need is uh, increasing there. Um, so again, is this one of those ones where I, I hate to say it, but we kind of have to play it by ear, you know? So we have this vision of what is normal, and we want to try to maintain that as best we can. Um, but permitted, um, you know, what the Fed, state, counties allow, we are going to modify our practices and execute what we are able to do. And then, of course, you know, maintaining that communication with our instructors and helping guide them on that path, whatever it might be. Great. I appreciate those updates. Um, my last question is, I know one of the phases that we were talking about is the use of parks and splash pads for passive use. Um, I, I guess this question might be more towards you guys. I do know that, I think I heard the Sierra Bella Park was just about complete, the new Sierra Delora Park. Um, obviously, we wouldn't be able to have a grand opening at this time, but would it be possible to have some kind of soft opening for the district for passive use at that part in, in the meantime leading up to a point at which we can have a grand opening ribbon cutting? Yeah, the, the, the issue of a grand opening, as you're well aware, Lincoln Parks, the, the new playground sits fenced and unused. Um, the issue in, in terms of any openings is the issue of gatherings, and there just flatly is no real discussion about public gatherings other than the few limitations of, of things um, like religious services. So at this point, none of that is allowable. Um, so while we would love to do that, at this point we just cannot do anything of that sort. Um, but if the pro if the park comes online and we're because I think at this point we're still in the maintenance um, phase of that, uh, should it come online and the park open, it will simply open and people can use it passively, keeping in mind uh, that that we are reminding folks that things like shelters, things like playgrounds, etc., specifically still prohibited from their use. Um, we're not doing anything in the realm of enforcement, um, but reminding folks that should they choose to use those things, they do so at their own risk. But there are some things like playground shelters um, that are prohibitive. Um, and splash pads, uh, again, that's recirculated water. It's chlorinated. Uh, we get out there and we sanitize it. So it's slightly different. And for whatever reason, that as an amenity has been specifically identified by both the state and the county as an allowable use. Um, so it's, it, again, it's just one of those things where trying to track this stuff on a daily basis and do what we can in the realm of normalcy is pretty complicated, um, just given the way that, that uh, health agencies are responding. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I, maybe I misspoke, but I totally understood that. I was more interested if it could be announced for passive use. Um, my understanding was that it was having its final walkthrough of some kind this week. Is that not accurate? We can confirm that, but I think what, kind of getting back to what you were indicating, is we could post something online, you know, welcome to our new park, uh, it's Sierra Bella, it's open for passive use, as all of our other parks are. We could make a social media announcement of some sort and put that online and kind of, again, let everyone know that it is there and available for passive use like all of the other parks currently are doing this time. Yes, I and would And maybe I would love we that. can do something um, after, after things open up a little bit more 
more of that grand opening celebration or something along those lines? Yes, I would love to see that. I know District 4 residents, especially um, directly in that area, are eager to passively use that park. And as of right now, they're told that it's not open. So I think just some kind of this is when it will be opened for passive use would be a great statement. So I would greatly appreciate that. We'll get that information and get it out there. Thank you so much. Um, okay, last question. Sorry. Agents of Discovery, I had a question. What is the target audience age-wise for the children of the families? And is it a do-at-your-own pace? Or you mentioned that you have staff there. So is it at set times or can a family do it anytime they choose? Because you mentioned it's at specific parks. Uh, yes, it is. Um, so let me get my notes there. Okay, so um, Agents of Discovery is really intended to be a, a family level program. So I, I think, you know, um, anyone, you know, five and up, or if you want to do it as a family together, um, you know, is probably the best way to experience that. But I think even the olders uh, could enjoy that. Um, you know, even our own director went out and gave it a go, and he had a lot of fun. Um, so it is um, a limited uh, program. We received a grant uh, for this. Otherwise, this is a program that you'd have to um, subscribe to as a city, and there's a pretty significant cost to it. Um, it's usually used by like zoos and um, like natural park areas. So it's interesting that we're using this on a municipal level. Uh, so we have it for the entire month of July as part of Parks Make Life Better Month. Uh, so what we're doing is we're rolling out missions uh, that you can participate in. And these uh, take place um, throughout the park area so that you kind of have you walking. Uh, so week one, again, is that Historic Civic Center uh, here. Uh, and then Santana Regional Park. Uh, so that will go for the whole entire month. Uh, then each additional week, we're adding additional parks. Uh, so with that, on those Mondays from 10 to 12, uh, we'll have the Lars on the Go team out there to kind of pump uh, uh, pump up the program, let people know about it, ask you know if they have questions or they're having a hard time using the app, they're there for you. But um, this is you know unrestricted. So as long as the park is open, you're more than welcome to go in there and give that a go. So if you want to get there in the early hours, you know maybe when it's a little bit cooler and the sun's not as hot, uh, that's great for you. Um, as well as in the evening, it'll be running there, um, and then it's. AR, so you just kind of move your phone around and you can see different critters or, you know, get the answers to different clues uh, and participate um, by interacting um, with the environment around you. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the update. Um, does anyone else have any other questions or comments? All right, then we will move on to Tom for, par um, sorry, Mr. Moody for park updates. Actually, uh, most of that was just covered in the conversations that occurred. So the, the parks remain open for um, walking and exercise, passive use. Um, and on top of that, Skyline Trail remains open for hiking and walking. And then as mentioned prior, picnic shelters, playgrounds, and those things still remain closed per state guidelines. Okay, and the commission received our uh, monthly reports on recreation service participation as well as the development impact fee fund. Um, do either of you have any comments or questions regarding those reports that we received? Okay, so that moves us to the commission calendar. Do we have any items for that calendar? My guess is no. Wah, wah. Um. It, it's, it's sort of a, yeah, we'll let you know as soon as we time. know. <laughs> we have passive calendars right now as well. All right, okay. All right, so that moves us on to commission members' reports and comments. So, Commissioner Veretti, this is a time when you, I'll let, um, how about I'll let Commissioner Almasi go first, so that you, uh, you're not put on the spot for uh, your first uh, report. Well, first of all, I think that you are to be commended to, like I told you previously, is that the, the work that you're doing um, speaks volumes because we're in a new normal, and this new normal is uncharted territory. And... You're being innovative and strategic in the way you're approaching this, and you're making sure that you're making as many opportunities for kids that may not get, or, or people that may not get the opportunity. Uh, I think getting the social media in, involved with this is going to be very good. My only question to you, Abby, are we getting the, the library van out there to do the things? that We started using Lars on the go again with Agents of Discovery. 
Okay. And so one of the things we're going to add to that is having a QR code that people can scan. So if maybe they don't have an e-card, a library card, they can scan that QR code and be led right where they can register. Have one that goes to our virtual LARS page. It's another way that we're going to promote those programs and services that we have online. Since people are a little tentative about taking a piece of paper, we want to try to maintain that safety. So those QR codes should lead them to some of what our staff have been working on while they visit Lars on the Go at the park. Very well done. My last comment is, is that my wife and I walked up and down Main Street, and we did it the other day. Actually, we did it on the 4th of July, and it was a lot easier on the other 4th of July's walking down Main Street than walking up Main Street. We learned that lesson really, really well. Kudos to you. I agree 100% with everything you said. Um, I totally understand where you guys are coming from in terms of things changing daily. Uh, Jason, it's amazing what you guys are doing, especially we talked earlier about the, the food distribution. Um, I know how important that is. Um, you know, hunger has no expiration, and that's been our that's been one of our goals as of late. So I. I appreciate and I commend that, and Abby as well. I know I know how how things how things go and how how difficult they can be, but I'm not surprised that you guys are you guys are killing it. So I appreciate you guys um, and keep doing keep working. And I too echo the other commissioners. Um, you know, just applauding all of the ideas and innovation and. Um, continuing to keep our community involved um, regardless of the obstacles. I appreciate that. I look forward to that. I obviously look forward to some return to normalcy at some point, hopefully, but I appreciate all that you're doing in the interim. So thank you all so much. Um, I did enjoy the 4th of July stuff immensely, so great job on that as well. Um, does anyone have any announcements to make? If I, if I may uh, make uh, just one, um, you may recall uh, earlier this year we um, sort of did an overview of the function and the roles of the Parks and Recreation Commission. And one of the, um, the roles that you guys fulfill is being advocates for Parks and Recreation. Uh, so just wanted to remind you and encourage you, if you did not have app opportunity uh, at uh, the last council meeting last Wednesday, uh, City Manager Jacob Ellis um, ran through uh, an issue related to a potential ballot measure um, that uh, a question of which may come before council as early as next week. Uh, his overview basically took a look at the city's financial condition currently and and all of the needs that we have now and moving towards the future. Uh, and so there will be an ongoing discussion, <clears throat> and excuse me, th ultimately this is a community discussion about whether or not there are real needs and how those needs moving forward are going to be met. And the consensus uh, has been uh, certainly uh, among some, uh, the last three city managers have all raised the issue. Um, Council Member Scott discussed the issue at length uh, during his uh, State of the City address last year uh, that um, uh, dollars and revenue moving forward are limited. Um, and so we have to look at alternative ways to generate revenue to not just to continue some of what we're doing, um, but certainly to improve in areas of maintenance and then to expand some of the services that we currently offer to do a better job of taking care of what we have, but also expanding opportunities for the future. All of that costs money. Uh, and so I encourage you as commissioners to be a part of that conversation, that discussion about whether or not um, that a ballot measure should move forward. And so if, if advocacy is an issue of interest for you specifically, um, I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to take a look at that um, presentation uh, provided last week. And then to be a part of the discussion that will likely take place uh, at next week's meeting and may even continue into August. Um, so that's just uh, an FYI. Uh, but again, strongly encourage you to take a look at the presentation and see how you, part, you can be part of that community discussion because it is a really important one for Corona. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And with that, I believe that we are done. So I will be ending this meeting at 6.56 p.m. Our next meeting will be held here on Wednesday, August 12th at 6 p.m. Thank you.